Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Hadith 83, about the time where your Iman will not be accepted from you. From Abu Huraira, the Prophet said, ثَلَاثٌ إِذَا خَرَجْنَا لَا يَنْفَعُ نَفْسًا إِيمَانُهَا لَمْ تَكُنْ آمَنَتْ مِنْ قَبْلُ أَوْ كَسَبَتْ فِي إِيمَانِهَا خَيْرًا طُلُوعُ الشَّمْسِ مِنْ مَغْلِبِهَا وَالدَّجَّالُ وَدَابَّةُ الْأَرْضُ Three things, when they come out, it will not benefit a soul to believe after that if it did not believe or have Iman before, nor did it work any righteousness in its time of Iman. And these three things are the sun rising from the west, at the jal and the beast of the earth. So this hadith now is in reference to the ayah of the Quran that when some of the signs of Allah come, then it will do no good to a person to believe then if it did not believe before. Because the point is that these signs are so manifest that the truth will become plain from the falsehood. So if a sign so manifest comes and then you believe, then it is not a test anymore because Allah has created this life as a test to see who will have Iman and who will not. So as for the sun rising from the west, of course this is one of the major signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. When people see this, they will know that Islam is the truth and they will believe. But it will do them no good. And this is the time limit of at tawbah Of course your time limit is that you must make tawbah before you know you're going to die. But as for the greater time limit, it is this, the sun rising from the west. As we find authentically in the Sunan, وَلَا تَنْقَضِعُ التَّوْبَةُ حَتَّى تَغْرُبَ الشَّمْسُ مِنْ مَغْرِبِهَا That at tawbah will not cease to exist until the sun rises from the west. Nor will it do any good when these three things arise for a person to be doing righteous actions if he was not doing any righteous actions during his Iman. In another version of the hadith in this chapter, the Prophet said that the sun goes down into prostration or into sajda to Allah Jalla wa'ala and it does that every time it sets and Allah tells it to rise again and this cycle goes on until there will come a time when Allah will tell it to go back where you came from, meaning from the west because the sun sets in the west. So it will return to the west, in other words, it will rise from the west. And so this is where the Prophet recited the ayah 158 from Surah Al-An'am. But can we take from this that the sun revolves around the earth? Because clearly in the hadith, the sun is the object which is doing the action. We say there are two ways of interpreting it. Either we can say the sun revolves around the earth because the sun is doing the action here, or we could say that the Prophet describes the sun doing the action because he's speaking from our standpoint of view. We are the ones who see the sun doing the action. So humans see the sun rising, they see the sun setting, and they see the sun moving across the sky. So from our point of view, the sun is doing the action. If we look at modern science now, we find that the earth rotates around the sun. Clearly the sun is bigger and the earth is smaller, and the smaller object, due to the gravitational force, revolves around the larger object. And of course this is true with the Earth and the Moon as well, as well as the moons of the other planets. We find the smaller object revolving around the larger object, because the gravitational pull of the larger object is stronger. So we can say that this hadith and the ayat of the Qur'an, which talk about the sun moving, do not contradict modern science because the Qur'an and this hadith are talking from the human standpoint of view. It's the same thing with English. We say sunrise and sunset. But of course in reality, sun is not rising and sun is not setting. Rather it is the earth which is moving around the sun. But when we say sunrise and sunset, we are speaking from the point of view of somebody who is on earth. Because we see the sun rising and the sun setting. So there is no contradiction here between the text of the Sharia and the scientific facts that we have today. As for the Dajjal and Dabatul Ard, these are also from the major signs of Yawm Al Qiyamah. As for this idea of the sun making a sajda, Yes, the sun makes a sajda. Of course, it does not do it the way we do it. It does it however it does it. We don't know. So the only thing left for us to do now is to simply believe in the text. As these are the matters which we do not have any knowledge of except from what has been revealed. So we restrict ourselves to the text only. And we don't need to bring our intellects and rational thought into play because these are matters where our intellects do not have a role to play. As these are matters of the unseen. And our intellects are only pertaining to that which is seen. Hadith 84, the beginning of revelation to the Prophet. This is the statement of Aisha. It is a long narration. So let us go straight into the translation. She says that the first revelation which the Prophet received were true dreams. He would not see anything except that in reality, the next morning it would happen exactly the way he saw it. Meaning no symbolic meanings. It would be literally the way he saw it. 
She said that the Prophet would then love to be alone and he would keep alone in the cave of Hira as an act of devotion and worship to Allah Jalla wa'ala. And he would stay there for many nights in a row before he would return back to his wife and he would keep with him some provisions in the cave. Then he would come back to Khadija and take more provisions until the truth suddenly descended upon him. She says that the angel came and he said to him, Iqra, read. And the Prophet replied, Ma ana biqari. I do not read, what means I cannot read. So the Prophet says that he grabbed me and covered me until I could not bear it anymore. Then he released me and again he said, Iqra, and he replied with the same answer. Then again he grabbed him until he could not bear it anymore and gave him the same order and he gave the same reply. So then this happened a third time. Then after releasing him the third time, the angel recited, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq. اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم The first five ayat of Surah Al-Alaq So the Prophet after this returned and he was severely shaking and he said to Khadija زملوني زملوني Wrap me with garments, wrap me with garments So she did so until his fear alleviated and he told Khadija what had happened and he told her that I fear for myself and Khadija replied Never Rather rejoice because by Allah, Allah will never humiliate you. Because by Allah you join ties of kinship, you are always truthful, you carry other people's burden, you give wealth to those who cannot earn for themselves, you honor the guest and you aid people who have been afflicted with certain calamities. And so after this Khadija took the Prophet to Waraqah ibn Nawfal, ibn Asad, ibn Abdul Uzza. And Waraqah was the cousin of Khadija. And he had converted from being a mushrik to being a Christian. And he used to write the Injil in Arabic, whatever Allah willed him to write. And he was an old man and had become blind. And Khadija said to him, O oh, my uncle, listen to what the son of your brother has to say. And Waraqa said, O oh, son of my brother, what do you see? And the Prophet narrated the story to him. And Waraqa said to him, This is the Namus which descended upon Musa. A Namus is a messenger who brings you secret news. I would that I was a young man. I would that I would be alive when your people kick you out of your home. And the Prophet replied, Are they going to drive me out? And Waraqa replied, Yes, no man has brought what you have brought, except that he has had enemies. And if this happens and I am alive, I would surely help you to the best of my ability. So this is a story about how the revelation all began. And of course, after this point, as you know, Islam continued from strength to strength. The immediate question here is that when all of this was happening, we can be absolutely sure that Aisha did not witness this event. So the only rational explanation is that the Prophet must have told it to her. And if it is asked to you, what was the first revelation which the Prophet received? Then most Muslims may reply by saying it was Jibreel who came to the Prophet and told him to read. But having read this narration, you know this is not correct. Rather, the first revelation to the Prophet were true dreams. And we know in other narrations that this happened for six months before the episode with Jibreel. As for the revelation coming down from Allah, then this happened over 23 years. So if we take six months as a fraction of 23 years, of course 23 times 12, and then you put six over that, to put it in a fraction format, we arrive at the fraction 1 out of 46. So true dreams, the Prophet said, is 1 out of 46th part of prophethood. As for the Al-Wahi, then this can have three meanings. Number one, it means ilham or an inspiration which you receive. And anyone can receive inspiration, even a non-prophet can receive inspiration. The mother of Musa received inspiration to put baby Musa in the basket and cast him in the sea. Allah gives inspiration to the bee to make your homes upon the mountains and the high places and traverse the ways of your Lord and eat from the fruits. So all these animals which are doing what they're doing, are doing so by Allah inspiring them. So this type of inspiration does not mean that you're a prophet. Secondly, al-wahi could mean to give some information quickly and secretly, as Zakaria salam, would do to his people when he would order them to make tasbih of Allah Jalla wa'ala. Allah says, فَخَرَجَ عَلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ مِنَ الْمِحْرَابِ فَأَوْحَىٰ إِلَيْهِمْ أَنْ سَبِّحُوا بُكْرَةً وَعَشِيَّةً Then he came out to his people from his private room and he told them using sign language to make tasbih of Allah in the morning and in the afternoon. So this is where you inform somebody quickly and secretly. 
And the third meaning is when somebody receives notification of the Sharia. And it is this type of wahi specifically which makes you into a prophet. The other two types are not specific to a prophet. And when we say the Sharia, we don't just mean rules and regulations, we mean the whole package. So it includes your aqidah and your acts of worship and everything which the Prophet teaches about the deen. So we take from this narration the good characteristics of the Prophet, even before he was made into a Prophet. Because first of all, he would not worship the false gods. And this is from the guidance of Allah Jalla wa'ala, is that he kept him away from shirk even before his prophethood. And so the Prophet would like to keep away from the people and practice his own private devotion to the one true deity worthy of worship. And of course he would do this in the cave of Hira. And this cave would be particularly difficult to reach as you would have to climb up the rocks. And we can learn a lesson from this because even nowadays it is a very good idea for people to cut themselves off from the world for a limited time and to just spend time between them and Allah Jalla wa'ala. A bit like an i'tikaf. But you don't have to go to the masjid though. You can do it in your home. The point is just some private time between you and Allah. And you cut yourself off from this world. So thereby you have a good balance. Because otherwise people can go to extremes and socialize too much. And this is not good for you. Because it can damage your personal relationship with Allah. But how did he worship Allah Jalla wa'ala? Because clearly he did not know how to pray. The answer is we don't actually know. Because it is not explained to us. So he would do whatever he would do, maybe he would meditate or just think about creation or perhaps something else. We cannot be sure. And all of this seclusion in the cave was preparing him for what was about to befall him. So then Jibreel descends upon him. The image of Jibreel will not have been the original image of Jibreel, which is with 600 wings. Normally Jibreel would come in the image of a man. And it is at this point that the Prophet becomes officially a Prophet. Before this, he did have revelation for six months as true dreams, but he was not officially a prophet at that time. It is when Jibreel comes to you that you officially become a prophet, because you have been informed by Allah Jalla wa'ala of the Sharia. So we find Jibreel descending upon him suddenly, not just that, but also grabbing him. So clearly we find a great shock factor. And so with this situation, the prophet knew that he could not have been hallucinating, or maybe his imagination playing tricks on him that this is a real event which is taking place. Otherwise, the temptation may be for somebody to pass it off as just his imagination playing tricks on him or perhaps he's hallucinating. But if you have a shock factor of this magnitude and you feel the pain which you are feeling, then you know you are not hallucinating. And so perhaps this is the reason why Allah ordered Jibreel to descend upon him suddenly and also to squeeze him and cause some pain and anguish. And Allah Jalla wa'ala has wisdom behind everything which he does. Notice when Jibreel recites the ayah, اِقْرَعْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقُ He did not recite بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ And so from this some scholars have taken that the basmala at the beginning of the surah is not part of the surah. Rather it is just there to separate out the surah. And this has also been reported by one of the companions. Other scholars say that it is part of the surah but it was revealed afterwards. Just like the other ayat of this surah were revealed afterwards. But the former opinion is the correct opinion that the basmala is not part of the surah and we have many other evidences to prove this for example authentically in the sunan the prophet said suratun thalathuna ayatan tashfa'u li sahibiha hatta yughfar a surah of 30 ayat which will intercede for its companion until he is forgiven and the prophet said tabarak alladhi bi yadihi almulk and this is of course surah almulk which is 30 ayat without the basmala and clearly we find the Prophet is fearing for himself. He was fearing perhaps he's going to die or perhaps he is turning mad. Then we find Khadija gives him solace. And from this we can infer the virtue of Khadija in that she gave the Prophet much support and psychological help which he needed. Look at how Khadija uses the good qualities of the Prophet to prove to him that because of these good qualities which you have, Allah will not humiliate you. Because a person who has such qualities does not deserve to be humiliated by Allah. So in this we find the intelligence of Khadija. She draws a sound conclusion from the evidences which she has. And also from this we can take that even before prophethood, the Prophet had many great qualities. And here in the hadith, six great qualities of the Prophet. And if you are asked, who was the first Muslim to believe in the Prophet? The answer is Khadija. But if you are then asked, who is the first male companion of the Prophet? Many people might say Abu Bakr. But the answer in fact is 
Waraqa ibn Nawfal. And Waraqa immediately recognized that this was Jibreel because he had knowledge from the scriptures of the past. And also we can infer from this narration the intelligence of Waraqa in that he knew from his studying of the past scriptures that a person like this Prophet is certainly going to be driven out of his home by the enemies who will not accept his message. And this is of course exactly what happened. Allah Jalla wa ala says in Surah Al-Anfal وَإِذْ يَمْكُرُ بِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِيُثْبِتُوكَ أَوْ يَقْتُلُوكَ أَوْ يُخْرِجُوكَ وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ And when the kuffar plotted against you to imprison you or kill you or drive you out of your home, meaning Mecca. They were plotting but Allah planned and Allah is the best of those who plans. Okay, we ask the question, what has this hadith got to do with Iman? Because the chapter is Al-Iman. And the answer is that Iman is not possible without the Wahi. Also note that Khadija radiallahu anha praises the Prophet in front of him when she mentions those six praiseworthy qualities of his. And this is okay because it will not lead to a person becoming proud. And certainly in that situation it was needed to calm him down. But the type of praise which is blameworthy is when you praise a person in front of his face and this will lead him to becoming proud and self-conceited. Or at least there's a genuine danger that he will become self-conceited. Note also that Aisha reporting this narration says that Waraka ibn Nawfil was a blind man. That is a defect. Can you refer to somebody using his defect? The answer is yes, if it is in order to identify that person, not in order to insult them. So notice the difference. Also, we ask the question, why did Jibreel alayhi salam squeeze the Prophet? And a feasible explanation to this is that if he just saw Jibreel, then the Prophet may have just explained this away as hallucination. Whereas when you actually feel the pain, then whenever you feel pain, you are literally feeling pain, hallucination or not. And so thereby, it will remove any doubts from the mind of the Prophet that he is hallucinating because he's actually physically feeling this pain. Not just once, not twice, but thrice. So as to remove all doubt that this is really happening and he's not just turning insane or just seeing things. So yes, sure it would have been painful, but sometimes you do have to go through pain to achieve the praiseworthy end. Wallahu a'lam. Hadith 85, Yahya asked Abu Salama what part of the Qur'an was sent down first and Abu Salama replied Ya ayyuhal muddathir He says then I said or was it Iqra and Abu Salama replied I asked Jabir ibn Abdullah which of the Qur'an was revealed first and Jabir replied Ya ayyuhal muddathir and then I asked him or was it Iqra then Jabir said I will narrate to you what the Prophet narrated to us and then Abu Salama narrated the words of Jabir who quoted the Prophet, جَاوَرْتُ بِحِرَاءٍ شَهْرًا For one month I was living in the cave of Hira. فَلَمَّا قَضَيْتُ جِوَارِي نَزَلْتُ فَاسْتَبْطَنْتُ بَطْنَ الْوَادِي Then when I finished my stay there, I came down and I went into the middle of the بَطْنُ الْوَادِي which is a valley. فَنُوذِيتُ And somebody called me. فَنَظَرْتُ أَمَامِي وَخَلْفِي وَعَنْ يَمِينِي وَعَنْ شِمَالِي فَلَمْ أَرَى أَحَدًا So I looked in front of me, behind me, to my right, to my left, and I did not see anyone. ثُمَّ نُوذِيتُ Then somebody called me again. فَنَظَرْتُ فَلَمْ أَرَى أَحَدًا So I looked and I did not see anyone. ثُمَّ نُوذِيتُ فَرَفَعْتُ رَأْسِي فَإِذَا هُوَ عَلَى الْعَرْشِ فِي الْهَوا فأخذتني رجفة شديدة فأتيت خديجة فقلت دثروني فدثروني فصبوا علي ماء فأنزل الله عز وجل يا أيها المدثر قم فأنذر وربك فكبر وثيابك فطهر Then again I was called out and I raised my head and behold there he was on his throne in the air meaning Jibreel and I began to shiver fervently and I went to Khadija and I said wrap me in garments wrap me in garments and put some and pour some water over me and then Allah sent down the ayah O oh, you wrapped in garments stand up and warn and make takbir of your Lord and purify your clothes so it is because of this narration there is a minority of the scholars who say that the first ayah of the Quran to be revealed were these opening ayat of Surat Al-Muddathir but we say no, the first ayah to be revealed was Iqra. But the first ayah which was revealed after a large gap 
was Al Muddathir because after this first scary episode with Jibreel grabbing the Prophet and the first five ayat of Iqra being revealed, the revelation stopped for a long time. And this is probably to give the Prophet time to adjust to his new mission as a Prophet. But then when the revelation recommenced, it recommenced with Ya Ayyuhal Muddathir. And with this ayah of Al Muddathir, the Prophet became a messenger because now his job was to convey the message as the ayah says قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ Stand up and warn. So it is not enough for you to just know the message of Allah, rather you have to warn others. And every single messenger has had to do this job. You have to warn, but also give glad tidings. So you have a balance. So we say that with Iqra, he became a prophet, and with Ya أَيُّهَ muddathir he became a rasul or a messenger. So a prophet is the one who is given the wahi of the third type which we spoke about, which is the notification of the message of Allah or the sharia. And this prophet conveys this message to people who are going to agree with him. As for a messenger or a rasul, he is more than a prophet. He also receives notification of the sharia, but he has to convey the message to a people who are going to oppose him. So there's the difference. If you're conveying a message to the people who are going to agree with you, then you're not a Rasul, you are a Nabi. We learn from this narration, what we did from the last one, that the Prophet is shocked, and he realizes that he is in shock. Because many Kuffar would claim that the Prophet was suffering some form of madness. But the problem with insanity or psychosis is that the person believes himself to be some type of God and does not realize that there is something wrong with him. He thinks it's perfectly okay for him to deem himself to be some type of God. But here the Prophet realizes that something is not right and not normal. And when a person has this self-realization, then this is not madness. Because mad people do not have this self-realization. Hadith 86, talking about the night journey. This is also a long narration, so let's get straight into the translation of it. From Anas bin Malik, the Prophet said, Al-Buraq was brought to me. And it is a long white animal, bigger than a donkey, but smaller than a mule. He said that with one step this animal reaches as far as the eye can see. And that's just with one step. I rode it until we came to Bayt al-Maqdis, which is Jerusalem. And I tied the animal to the door of the masjid, which is where all the prophets would tie the animals. Then I entered the masjid and I prayed in it two rak'at. Then I went out. Then Jibreel came with a cup of khamar and a cup of milk. And I chose the milk, and Jibreel said, اخترت الفطرة You have chosen the fitr. And the explanation given for this by the scholars is that you have chosen either Islam or you have chosen to remain upright or straight. Then I was taken up to the heaven, and Jibreel asked the door to be opened, and it was asked, Who are you? And he said, Jibreel. And then it was asked, Who is with you? And he said, Muhammad. And it was asked, Has he been sent? Meaning to say, Has he been sent up to the heavens? Because only those who are allowed to enter the heaven can do so. And some scholars have understood it to mean, has he been sent as a prophet? Jibreel said yes, and the door was opened, and behold, he was standing in front of Adam. And Adam welcomed him, and made dua for him, for goodness, and then he was taken up again to the second heaven. Jibreel sought permission, and the same questions were asked. The same three questions as with the first heaven. Who are you? Who is with you? And has this person been sent? So the door was opened, and he saw Isa ibn Maryama, and Yahya ibn Zakariya, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhima. And so these two prophets welcomed him and made dua for him for goodness. And then he went to the third heaven and the same process of the questioning and answers. And in the third heaven he saw Yusuf alayhi salam. And the prophet says he has been given half of all beauty. And so Yusuf welcomed him and made dua for him for goodness. Then he went up to the fourth heaven and the same process and he was met with Idris alayhi salam and he welcomed him and made dua for him and the Prophet recited وَرَفَعْنَاهُ مَكَانًا عَلِيَّ and we raised him to a high place. This is talking about Idris. Then he went to the fifth heaven and the same process of seeking permission and the door was opened and he met Harun alayhi salam and he welcomed him and made dua for him. Then he went to the sixth heaven and was met with Musa alayhi salam and he welcomed him and made dua for him. Then he went to the seventh heaven and he was met with Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Ibrahim was resting his back against the Al Baytul Ma'mur, the inhabited house. And this is a place where every day 70,000 angels enter, never to return back. 
Then the Prophet said, he was taken to a Sidratul Muntaha, and this is a tree in the seventh heaven. Its leaves are like the ears of elephants, and its fruits are like Qilal, and these are water containers made of pottery clay. A Sidra is a lot tree, and so this is the farthest lot tree, because it is in the seventh heaven. Then when it was covered by the command of Allah, it underwent such a change that no one is able to describe its beauty. Then Allah revealed to me what he revealed, and he made obligatory upon me fifty prayers in one day and night. So I descended to Musa, and he asked me, what did your Lord make farad upon you? And I said, fifty prayers. And Musa said, return to your Lord, and ask him to reduce it. Your ummah will not be able to bear it, because I put this test to Bani Israel, and they were not able to stand up to the task. So I returned to my Lord, and I said, Ya Rabbi, khaffif ala ummati. O oh Lord, make it lighter upon my ummah, and he reduced it by five. Then I returned back to Musa, and informed him that it is reduced by five, and again he said that your ummah will not be able to bear it, so return and ask for it to be lightened yet more. And so he kept on going back and forth, until Allah said to him, O oh Muhammad, there are five prayers in a day and a night, and for each prayer there is a tenfold reward. So this would be the reward of fifty prayers. And whoever makes a conviction to do good and does not do it, one good reward is written for him, but whoever does it, then ten times the reward is written for him. And whoever makes a conviction to do evil, but does not do it, then nothing is written for him. And whoever performs the evil, then one evil act is written for him. And then I descended to Musa and informed him, and Musa said, no, return again, and ask for it to be lightened. And the Prophet said, I am too shy to return again. So this is the story of the night journey. We also find that the last ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah were revealed on this night, and the narration for this is coming up. And also in the Sunan, the Prophet says, مَا مَرَرْتُ لَيْلَةَ أُسْرِيَ بِي بِمَلَئٍ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ إِلَّا قَالَ لِي يَا مُحَمَّدْ مُرْ أُمَّتَكْ بِالْحِجَامَةِ I did not pass by any angel on the night of ascension, except that he said, O oh Muhammad, order your ummah to perform al-hijama, or cupping. This night journey, according to the majority and correct opinion, happened with both body and soul. Because some people say that it happened during a dream. But this cannot be true because the Quraysh did not believe the claim of the Prophet of the night journey. And this can only be possible if it was a bodily action. Because in a dream, anybody can go up on a night journey. And Allah says, Subhan alladhi asra bi abdihi laylan. Subhan be to the one who took his slave on the night journey. So he says, Bi'abdihi, with his slave. And this can only happen with body and soul, because the slave is body and soul, not just soul on its own. And we find this animal, Al Buraq, slightly smaller than a mule but bigger than a donkey. It appears this animal moves at an unbelievable speed. He was given the choice between milk and khamar. One might ask, if khamar is haram, why did Jibreel bring it to him? The answer is, at that particular point in time, one year before the hijrah, Khamar was not haram, it was halal. But the Prophet chose milk because milk is more healthy and it is nutritional and wholesome. This is why we have babies drinking milk, it is the best type of nutrition. As for khamar, then its harms are well known and the Prophet called khamar ummul khaba'ith, the leader or the root of all evil and impure things. Now when we say impure, we mean spiritually impure, otherwise khamar is not physically impure according to the weightier opinion. We can also take from the narration that when you want to enter upon the house of someone, you seek permission just like Jibreel sought permission for the gates of the heavens to be opened. We find he met all these prophets. Did he meet the prophets in body and in soul or just soul? This is not particularly important for us to answer. The point is it happened. We can be sure that with Isa alayhi salam, it was body and soul because Allah has raised Isa alayhi salam. As for the other prophets, it could have been just the soul as their bodies are buried, and Allah knows best. Also from other narrations, we find that the Prophet, when he went to speak to Allah Jalla wa'ala, he heard the pen writing down the Qadr. As Allah says, Kulla yawmin huwa fi sha'an. Allah is doing something every day. So the Prophet heard the writing of the pen, as the Qadr is written down, everything which is going to happen in the future. We can see from this story how Allah Jalla wa'ala intends our life to be. He wanted us to pray 50 prayers in a day, if this is spread out during the day, then you will have hardly any time to do anything else. And so this ummah owes a great debt of gratitude to Musa alayhi salam, who ordered the Prophet to go back and have it reduced. Musa made an analogy between his ummah and this ummah. We could argue that this analogy is not correct because the ummah of Musa were rebellious by their very nature. 
As for this ummah, it is far more submissive, or at least a large portion of it anyway. But we can take from the narration that you should consult somebody who has experience, just as the Prophet took the advice of Musa, because Musa had been there, done it. We also take the mercy of Allah Jalla wa'ala, in that he multiplies our good deeds by ten, and this is for all good deeds. Also we take the virtue of the Prophet, he remained calm and collected, even in front of supernatural and amazing signs which he saw. We can also take that the heavens have doors, and Allah tells us in the Qur'an about the kuffar, لَا تُفَتَّحُ لَهُمْ أَبَوَابُ السَّمَاءِ That the doors of the heavens will not be opened for them, and the only doors which will be opened would be of Jahannam. As Allah says, وَقِيلَ دُخُلُوا أَبْوَابَ جَهَنَّمَ خَالِذِينَ فِيهَا فَبِئْسَ مَثْوَ الْمُتَكَبِّرِينَ And it will be said, enter the doors of Jahannam, dwelling therein forever, was an evil place for those who were proud. Also we take from this that Allah speaks with a voice and with words which can be understood. The Asha'ir say that the speech of Allah is simply the knowledge of Allah and he creates the voice and the letters to express his knowledge or the meaning which he wants to convey. The Mu'tazila and Jahmiya say that Allah does speak whenever he wants to but he creates his speech. So it is not from his attributes. And we also take from the narration that the Prophet was somebody who was modest and shy because he could not bear to return to Allah again, to have it yet reduced from five. Hadith 87, in the same chapter, from Anas ibn Malik, the Prophet ﷺ said, أُتِيتُ فَانْطَلَقُوا بِي إِلَى زَمْزَمْ فَالشُّرِحَ عَنْ صَدْرِي ثُمَّ غُسِلَ بِمَاءِ زَمْزَمَ ثُمَّ أُنْزِلْتُ I was brought and they took me to the Zamzam, and my chest was ripped open, and I was washed with the water of Zamzam, then I was put down. And in the following narration, also from Anas bin Malik, he gives another account. He says that Jibreel came to the Prophet when he was just a small boy, playing with the other kids, and Jibreel took him, wrestled him to the floor, and cut his chest, and took out a little piece from his heart. And Jibreel said, this is the share of shaitan from you. So it's like he's taking out the share of shaitan from him, and thus purifying him. Then Jibreel brought a gold tray, which had Zamzam in it, and he washed his heart with that. And then he put his heart back in and sealed up his chest. As for the other boys, they ran to the breastfeeding mother of the Prophet, and they said that Muhammad has been killed. So they went to him, meaning to the Prophet, and the Prophet's color, meaning the skin color, had changed because of the fright. And Anna says that I used to see the mark of the stitching on the chest of the Prophet. So it appears after this that there are two episodes where Jibreel split open the chest of the Prophet and washed his heart out with Zamzam. One happened when he was a small kid, and the other one happened during the time of Isra wal Mi'raj. And this is in order to purify the heart of the Prophet and to fill it with Iman and Hikmah. Notice here that the Zamzam water is used, not just any water. And this is because Zamzam has extra blessings in it, and it is not like the normal water. So therefore drinking Zamzam and washing in Zamzam is a good idea because of the extra blessings in this water. Notice, he says that Jibreel brought a golden tray of water. Can we take from this that it's permissible to use golden trays for food and drink? The answer is no. This is something specific to Jibreel. The Prophet gave us specific instructions that we are not allowed to use gold and silver when it comes to food utensils. Also in another narration, in the same chapter, we won't quote the whole of it, but it says that when he entered into the first heaven, he saw a man. And this man had some pillows or cushions on his right hand side and some cushions on his left hand side. And when he took a look at the cushions on the right, he laughed. And when he looked at the cushions on his left, he cried. And this man said to the Prophet, Welcome, righteous Prophet and a righteous son. And the Prophet asked, O oh, Jibreel, who is this? And Jibreel said, This is Adam. And these cushions on his right and on his left are the number of his progeny. Those on the right are the people of Jannah, which is why he laughed when he saw them, and those on his left are the people of the fire from his progeny, which would explain why he cried. And then the Prophet says he went up to the second heaven and the door was opened. So we can take from this that Adam alayhi salam has much compassion for his progeny in that he felt extremely sorry for those of his progeny who were in Jahannam. And this is the case with all Prophets, they are extremely merciful and compassionate towards the people, always desiring the best for them. Note that if you have the Sahih Muslim, in other versions of the Night of Isra wal Mi'raj, the order in which he met the Prophet is different. So in one narration, he meets Idris, then he meets Musa, then he meets Isa, 
Then he meets Ibrahim, which is not the same order as the first narration. So is this now a contradiction? We say no, it's not a contradiction. The correct order is that which is given in the first narration, because in the Sahih of Muslim, it is normally the first narration in the chapter which is the most authentic. The ones coming afterwards are less authentic. So that's the correct order. So what about the other narration which gives the other order? We say this narration is not talking about the chronological order. Because in Arabic, the word thumma means and then. So this is a chronological order. But it can also mean, depending on the context, furthermore. And when you say furthermore, this is not denoting a chronological order. It's just denoting a set of events which happen. Not necessarily in that chronological order. So thumma can mean and then, or it can mean furthermore. And this latter meaning does not denote a time sequence. In other narrations of this chapter, he also describes Musa as being a brown man, tall with curly hair. And Isa as being somebody of medium height, with a reddish white complexion and long lank hair. We also find in one of the narrations, he says that he saw two rivers, and they were the Nil and the Furat. This is the river Nile and the river Euphrates, which are well-known rivers today. This does not mean that these two rivers came down from Jannah. Rather, what this means is that these two rivers, which he saw in Jannah, resembled the Nile and the Euphrates. And he says he saw two other rivers, but they were hidden from him, so he could not see them properly. So he saw four rivers in Jannah. Also, let's just stop to appreciate the status of the Salah in Al-Islam, in that it is the only act of Ibadah which was actually ordered in the heavens themselves, and the highest heaven at that when Allah Jalla wa'ala spoke directly to the Prophet, no intermediary involved. Just pondering over this will enlighten you as to the status of the Salah and the value it holds with Allah Jalla wa'ala. So if you know anyone who are not performing their Salah, then try turning their attention to this narration. And when you truly ponder over this, it becomes clear to you that the difference between Islam and Kufr is the Salah. So the Salah is the red line that we draw on the ground. On this side of it is Islam, and on the other side it is Al-Kufr Al-Akbar. Hadith 88 from Ibn Abbas, he says that the Prophet passed by the valley of Al-Azraq, that's the name of the valley, and the Prophet asked the companions, Ayyu wadin hadha? Which valley is this? They said, this is the Wadi Al-Azraq. And the Prophet then said, Ka'anni anzuru ila Musa alayhi salam, حَابِطًا مِنَ الثَّنِيَّةِ وَلَهُ جُعَارٌ إِلَى اللَّهِ بِالتَّلْبِيَةِ As if I can see Musa alayhi salam coming down from the mountain pathway and he is raising his voice with the talbiyah. Then they pass by the mountain of Harasha and the Prophet asked أَيُّ ثَنِيَّةِ هَذِهِ Which mountain pathway is this? And they said ثَنِيَّةُ Harsha. This is the mountain pathway of Harasha. That's the name. And then the Prophet said كَأَنِّي أَنظُرُ إِلَى يُونُسَ بْنَ مَتَّهِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامُ عَلَى نَاقَةٍ حَمْرَاءَةٍ جَعْدَةٍ عَلَيْهِ جُبَّةٌ مِنْ صُوفٍ خِطَامُ نَاقَتِهِ خُلْبَةٌ وَهُوَ يُلَبِّي As if I could see Yunus ibn Matta عليه السلام on a red camel which is sturdy so it's like a bulky camel and Yunus is wearing a jubba made of wool and the bridle of the camel is made of fibers and he is making talbiyah so we take from this that both of these prophets would have performed the Hajj. This is why the Prophet is seeing these people. And the Hajj was ordained on the prophets and nations before us as well. Even on the prophets of Banu Israel. Because both of these prophets are from Banu Israel and not from the Arab. We find here that Musa is raising his voice with the Talbiyah. And this is the rule. You raise your voice with the Talbiyah. Just as Musa did here and just as the Prophet ordered us to do. And this ruling, the ulama say, is specific to the males and not the female. But the females do it quietly. Hadith 89 from Abdullah ibn Umar. He says that the Prophet described al-Masih al-Dajjal to the people one day. And the Prophet said, Inna Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala laysa bi'a'war. Ala inna al-Masih al-Dajjal a'war u'ayn al-yumna. Ka'anna aynahu aynabatun tafiyya. Verily, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala is not one-eyed, and Al-Masih al-Dajjal is one-eyed from the right eye, as if it is a floating grape, or an extinguished grape, depending on how you pronounce Tafiyah. 
And the Prophet went on to say, Arani laylata fil manami عند الكعبة. I saw myself one night at the Kaaba. This is in a dream. فَإِذَا رَجْلٌ آدَمُ كَأَحْسَنِ مَا تَرَى مِنْ أُدُمِ الرِّجَالِ تَضْرِبُ لِمَّتُهُ بَيْنَ مَنْ كِبَيْهِ رَجْلُ الشَّعْرِ يَقْطَرُ رَأْسُهُ مَاءً Behold, there was a man of a brown color, the best looking brown colored man that you will see. His hair came up to his shoulder blades. They were long and water was dripping from them. وَاضِعًا يَدَيْهِ عَلَى مَنْ كِبَيْهِ رَجُلَيْنِ He had his hands on the shoulders of two men. وَهُوَ بَيْنَهُمَا يَطُوفُ بِالْبَيْتِ And he was between them, making tawaf around the house, meaning the Kaaba. فَقُلْتُ مَنْ هَذَا فَقَالُوا الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرْيَمُ And I asked, who is this? And they said, this is Al-Masih ibn Maryam. وَرَأَيْتُ وَرَاءَهُ رَجُلًا جَعْدًا قَطَطًا And I saw behind him a stocky man with short curly hair. اعور عين اليمنى one eye meaning the right eye was extinguished كأشبه من رأيت من الناس بابن قطن the person he most resembles to from the people I've seen is ابن قطن واضع يديه على منكب رجلين he had both his hands on the shoulders of two men يطوف بالبيت فقلت من هذا فقال هذا المسيح الدجال and he was making tawaf around the house and I asked, who is this? And they said, this is Al-Masih Ad-Dajjal. So first of all, the Prophet says, Allah is not one-eyed. We can infer from this that Allah has two eyes. Because if Allah is not one-eyed, then he must be two-eyed. If it was the case that he had three or more eyes, then the Prophet would have made this plain. Because having three eyes would be superior to having two eyes. But because the Prophet did not make this clear, then the most sensible inference we can make from this is that Allah has two eyes. Of course, his eyes don't resemble our eyes, and they are fitting to him, and there is nothing like unto him. As for al-Masih al-Dajjal, al-Dajjal means somebody who deceives. It comes from Dajjal, which means to put a coat of paint on a camel who has skin disease, so you hide his skin disease. So this is obviously a type of deception, so al-Dajjal means one who deceives much. As for al-Masih, some scholars say it comes from as siyaha which means tourism, because al-Masih is going to tour the world. But the stronger opinion is it comes from masaha, which means to wipe. This is because his right eye will be wiped and it will be extinguished. So it will be mamsuh or something which is wiped. As for Ibn Maryam being called al-Masih, then this comes from masaha, which means to wipe. This is because al-Masih would wipe the people and would heal them. So he would heal the leprosy, he would heal those who were born blind. And this is because he wipes them. One might say that it is well known that al-Masih al-Dajjal will not enter Mecca. So how is it that the Prophet is seeing this person making tawaf around the Kaaba? The answer to this is that, firstly we can say, he will not enter Mecca only when he is sent as the Ad-Dajjal who is going to deceive the people. But before then, it is possible for him to enter Mecca and al Madina. And then the second answer could be that this was a dream. And when we say he will not be allowed to enter Mecca and al Madina, then this is in real life, not in the dream world. The Prophet resembles Ad-Dajjal to a man called Ibn Qatan. Is this not backbiting? The answer is no, because Ibn Qatan is a person who died in Jahiliyyah as a kafir. And so you are allowed to backbite a kafir. You are not allowed to backbite a Muslim. We take from this that it is permissible to tell other people what you dreamt of, as long as it's not a nightmare which you dreamt of. Because in the Sahih, we have one narration in which a companion tells the Prophet that he saw in a dream, his head is cut off and is rolling away and he's chasing after his head. And the Prophet said, لا تخبر بتلعب الشيطان بك في منامك Don't inform us of the shaytan playing with you in your dream. But as for if you want your dream interpreted, then you should go to somebody who is trustworthy and knowledgeable and will be able to interpret your dream. And from this narration, we find something of the description of Isa ibn Maryam and Ad-Dajjal. Ad-Dajjal seems to be of a stocky build with curly hair. Isa ibn Maryam is of a reddy white complexion with a long hair. And we know before that he is of a medium height, neither too short nor too tall. Hadith number 90 about the Siddratul Muntaha. From Abdullah, he says when the Prophet was taken up on the night journey, he came to the Siddratul Muntaha and it is in the sixth heaven, he says. Everything that ascends up from the earth stops there. So this is the final terminal point. So this is why it's called Al-Muntaha because Al-Muntaha means a place where something finishes or ceases to exist. And he says, and whatever descends from above this tree ends at this tree. So again, it's the final terminal point. And he quoted the ayah, إِذْ يَغْشَ السِّدْرَةَ مَا يَغْشَ 
when that which covers the low tree covers it. He says what this means is golden moths. So golden moths are covering this lot tree. And he says that the Prophet on the night journey was given three things. He was given firstly the five times prayer. Secondly, he was given the last ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah. And also the contract that anyone who does not commit shirk will have his sins forgiven. So we find in this narration he's saying that the Sidratul Muntaha is in the sixth heaven. We know from the previous narration that it is in the seventh heaven. So this could be a lapse of memory from one of the narrators or from Abdullah. Or we might say that the Sidra begins in the sixth heaven and it reaches up to the seventh heaven. And Allah Jalla wa Allah knows best. As for the final ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah, then this would be the final two ayat of the Surah Al-Baqarah, which you are recommended to recite before you go to sleep, to grant you protection from the shayateen. And also we take from this hadith the virtue of a tawheed in that it will have your sins forgiven. It expiates for your sins, even the major sins, according to the opinion of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Hadith 91, Ibn Mas'ud said about the statement of Allah, فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَى So he was at a distance of two bows or even nearer. Ibn Mas'ud says that the Prophet saw Jibreel with 600 wings. Notice here that in the Qur'an we read, he was a distance of two bows or closer. So is Allah in doubt whether it was a distance of two bows or was it closer? Of course Allah cannot be in doubt. So what does this mean? It means that he was closer than a distance of two bows. So it would mean he was a distance of two bows, nay he was even closer. And it could have another interpretation that if he was not a distance of two bows, he was closer. So it's a way the Arab used to emphasize the fact that he was definitely a distance of two bows. And if anything, he would be closer. So it's a way to emphasize what you're saying. So these are two ways which we can understand. We have a similar situation about Yunus alayhi salam. Allah says, فَأَرْسَلْنَاهُ إِلَى مِئَةِ أَلْفٍ أَوْ يَزِيدُونَ And we sent him to a hundred thousand people or more. So how much was it then? A hundred thousand or more? The first way to interpret it would be, we sent him to a hundred thousand people, nay, it was even more. And the second way to interpret it would be, we sent him to at least a hundred thousand people. And if it was not a hundred thousand, it was more. But it definitely was not any less. We find here that Jibreel appeared to the Prophet in his original form with 600 wings. This was on the night of Isra wal Mi'raj. And the Malaika have these wings and they fly with them and they fly with great speed. And some people say that when Sulaiman asked for the throne of the Queen of Saba and it arrived before him, before he could even wink, then some Mufassirun say that it was a Malak or an angel who brought the throne to him. So these Malaika can go at speeds even greater than that of a jinn. Also in the same surah of Al-Najm, Allah says, مَا كَذَبَ الْفُؤَادُ مَا رَأَى His heart did not lie as to what he saw. And he's talking about Jibreel alayhi salam with 600 wings. Also Abdullah says about the ayah, وَلَقَدْ رَأَى مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى and he saw the greatest signs of his Lord, Abdullah says, it was Jibreel in his original image with 600 wings. Of course, on the night journey, the Prophet saw many great signs of Allah. And what is amazing is that the Prophet had such self-control in that he did not look at anything which was not permitted for him to look at. So all that which was brought before him, he looked at it. Otherwise, the natural reaction would be, that when you enter into such an amazing place would be to look all around you, up, down, left, right, in front of you, behind you, and really explore the whole scenery. But as for the Prophet on that night, he only saw that which was presented to him. He did not move his sight left and right. And this is where Allah says, مَا زَاغَ الْبَصَرُ وَمَا تَغَى The sight did not deviate, nor did it transgress the limits. Hadith 92, Abu Huraira says about the ayah, وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى and he saw him on another descent. He says this is referring to Jibreel. He saw Jibreel. As for Ibn Abbas, he says that the Prophet saw Allah with his heart twice. In the first instance, it is where Allah says, مَا كَذَبَ الْفُؤَادُ مَا رَأَى The heart did not lie as to what he saw. And the second instance, وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أخرى. And he saw him a second descent. So Ibn Abbas says that the Prophet saw Allah in his heart. So this appears to be a contradictory tafsir. Let us move on to another narration in the same chapter. And this is a statement of Aisha. Masruq, one of the tabi'een, 
says that he was reclining in the room of Aisha and she said to him, there are three things which if somebody utters and he has fabricated a great lie against Allah. And so Masaruq says, what are they? And Aisha says, whoever claims that the Prophet saw his Lord, meaning Allah, then he has lied against Allah. Masaruq says, I was reclining, then I sat up straight, and I said, O oh mother of the believers, just hang on a second. Didn't Allah say, وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ بِالْأُفْقِ الْمُبِينَ And he saw him in the plain horizon, and also, وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى And he saw him in another descent. So Masaruq is thinking that this refers to the Prophet seeing Allah. The Aisha replies that I was the first person to ask the Prophet about this, meaning about this ayah, and the Prophet said, إِنَّمَا هُوَ جِبْرِيلُ لَمْ أَرَهُ عَلَى صُورَتِهِ أَلَّتِي خُلِقَ عَلَيْهَا غَيْرَ هَاتَيْنِ الْبَرَّتَيْنِ رَأَيْتُهُ مُنْهَبِطًا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ سَادًا عِظَمُ خَلْقِهِ مَا بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ This is only Jibreel. I saw him on his image on which he was created only two times. I saw him coming down from the sky and the greatness of his creation filled everything between the heaven and the earth. And then Aisha says to Masruq, Did you not hear the statement of Allah? لا تدركه الأبصار وهو يدرك الأبصار وهو اللطيف الخبير Vision cannot encompass him but he encompasses the vision and he knows the secret and the open knowledge. And she says, did you not hear the statement of Allah? وَمَا كَانَ لِبَشَرٍ أَنْ يُكَلِّمَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَّا وَحْيًا أَوْ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حِجَابٍ أَوْ يُرْسِلَ رَسُولًا فَيُوحِيَ بِإِذْنِهِ مَا يَشَاءِ إِنَّهُ عَلِيٌّ حَكِيمٌ It is not for a man to speak to Allah, except that it be a revelation, or from behind a hijab, or that Allah would send a messenger, and he would grant him the revelation with the permission of Allah, whatever he wants. Verily, he is the high, the wise. Then she said to him about the second Fabrication. Whoever claims that the Prophet hid anything from the Qur'an, then he has fabricated a great lie against Allah. Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الرَّسُولُ بَلِّغْ مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكْ وَإِنْ لَمْ تَفْعَلْ فَمَا بَلَّغْتَ رِسَالَتَهُ O oh, Messenger, convey what has been sent down to you from your Lord, and if you do not do it, then you have not conveyed his message. Then about the third fabrication, she says, Whoever claims that the Prophet knows the unseen, then he has fabricated a great lie against Allah. Allah says, قُلْ لَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ الْغَيْبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Say, none in the heavens and the earth knows about the unseen except Allah. In another narration, there is an addition that Aisha says, if the Prophet was going to hide any ayah of the Qur'an, it would be this one. And this is ayah 37 from Surah Al-Ahzab. وَإِذْ تَقُولُ لِلَّذِي أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَأَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْسِكْ عَلَيْكَ زَوْجَكَ وَاتَّقِ اللَّهَ وَتُخْفِي فِي نَفْسِكَ مَنْ اللَّهُ مُبْدِيهِ وَتَخْشَ النَّاسَ وَاللَّهُ أَحَقُّ أَنْ تَخْشَى And when you said to the one whom Allah has favored and you have favored, keep hold of your wife and fear Allah, and you kept in yourself hidden, what Allah brought out in the open, and you feared the people, but Allah has more right that you should fear him. And this is pertaining to the story of Zayd ibn Haritha and his wife Zainab bin Tajahsh. That Allah had the Prophet marry Zainab bin Tajahsh. And this is because Zainab bin Tajahsh is permissible for the Prophet to marry. Because the people would think that if you have adopted a son, you are not allowed to marry his daughter. And this is a jahiliya belief and has no basis in Islam. Your adopted son is not your biological son, neither is he your son through breastfeeding. Therefore his wife is permissible for you to marry if that person divorces her, because there is nothing preventing you from marrying her, neither through blood relation, nor breastfeeding relation, nor through marriage relation. Yes, it's true, you are not allowed to marry the wife of your son, but your adopted son is not your real son. So Allah exposes the fact here that the Prophet was fearing the people, but he should have been fearing Allah in this particular situation. So let's get back to the situation of seeing Allah. The correct opinion is, the Prophet did not see Allah Jalla wa'ala with his eyes, and the narration for this is coming up. It is possible for the Prophet, but what Ibn Abbas says is that he saw Allah with his heart, so he would have saw Allah in his dream, but not in real life with his eyes. We find here Masruq is leaning in the presence of Aisha, but we would have to assume that there is a hijab between them because Aisha is not a mahram to Masruq. Aisha says that the Prophet did not see Allah, and as her evidence, she uses this ayah, that the vision does not encompass him, but he, meaning Allah, encompasses the vision. And we would have to say we disagree with this ayah being used as evidence that you cannot see Allah. In fact, the Ahlul Bid'ah, use this narration to say that 
Allah will not be seen in the hereafter. And they use this ayah as well. But this ayah is saying that you cannot encompass Allah with your vision. So you cannot see the whole of Him. It does not mean to say you cannot see part of Him, which is exactly what will happen in the hereafter. So encompassing Him in your vision is not the same as actually seeing Him, meaning seeing a part of Him. As for the other ayah from Surah Ashura, then that's clear enough. The Prophet spoke to Allah, but it was behind a hijab. Just as Musa spoke to Allah, but he did not see him. As for this idea of the Prophet hiding any part of the Qur'an, then if somebody accuses the Prophet of hiding some part of the Qur'an, then is he not fabricating a lie against the Prophet? The answer is yes, certainly he is. But why does Aisha say that he is fabricating a lie against Allah? And the answer is because Allah is the one who says that we have sent down the dhikr and we will guard it. So if Allah is guarding this dhikr, then it cannot be possible for anyone to hide any part of the Qur'an. So if somebody claims that the part of the Qur'an is hidden, then he has lied against Allah. He's actually saying that Allah has not guarded the dhikr and has allowed part of the Qur'an to be hidden. As for the ayah which he quotes, O Prophet, convey what has been sent down to you from your Lord. And if you do not do it, then you have not conveyed the message. What this means is that if you hide even one small part of the message, then it is as if you have not conveyed the whole of the message. So you hide 1% of the message, it is like you hiding 100% of the message. That's how we understand the ayah. Otherwise, somebody might say, this ayah doesn't make sense because it is saying, if you don't convey the message, then you have not conveyed the message. So this is simply repeating yourself. But we say no. The correct way to understand the ayah is as we have said. Also we find from this, a good teaching technique is that you give a ruling and you give the evidence to back it up afterwards. And this is the habit which we need to get into. Ruling with the evidence and also justify how the evidence proves what you are trying to prove. So give that bridge between your evidence and the ruling which you are promoting. As for this ayah of Surah Al-Ahzab, about the Prophet fearing the people, it definitely shows that the Prophet was not responsible for coming up with this Qur'an. No man would ever include something like this, which exposes your deeper inner secrets, that you were fearing the people in yourself. Nobody would expose himself like this. So if somebody is claiming to be a Prophet, he would not want to expose himself in this way. So it shows the Prophet has no control over what comes down in the Qur'an. There are many other ayats as well, in which Allah reprimands the Prophet. In Surah Al-Tahreem, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِيُّ لِمَا تُحَرِّمُ مَا أَحَلَّ اللَّهُ لَكْ تَبْتَغِي مَرْضَاتَ أَزْوَاجِكْ O Prophet, why are you making haram what Allah has made halal for you, seeking the pleasure of your wives? Likewise we find, عَفَ اللَّهُ عَنْكَ لِمَا أَذِنْتَ لَهُمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكَ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَتَعْلَمَ الْكَاذِبِينَ May Allah overlook your faults. Why did you allow them to stay behind until it became clear to you those who were telling the truth to stay behind from going out to war and those who were lying? Likewise in Surah Al-Anfal, when the Prophet took the ransom payment instead of putting the prisoners to death, which is what he should have done, Allah says, مَا كَانَ لِنَبِيٍ أَن يَكُونَ لَهُ أَسْرًا حَتَّى يُثْخِنَ فِي الْأَرْضِ It is not for a Prophet that he should have prisoners of war until he slaughters much in the land. تُرِيدُونَ عَرَضَ الدُّنْيَا وَاللَّهُ يُرِيدُ الْآخِرَةِ وَاللَّهُ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ You want the material goods of this world, but Allah wants the akhirah, and Allah is the honored, the wise. لَوْلَا كِتَابٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ سَبَقَةِ لَمَسَّكُمْ فِيمَا أَخَذْتُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ Were it not for a previous ordainment from Allah, a severe torment would have touched you for what you took. Clearly here the Prophet made a mistake and Allah is not going to allow this mistake and is going to show the Prophet that he went wrong. Some people may say, no, the Prophet is free from making any mistakes. How dare you say the Prophet made mistakes? This is an insult to the Prophet. We say, no, rather, this is one of the best arguments to say that the Qur'an is not from the Prophet. Otherwise, you would not find ayat like these in them. No false Prophet would want to humiliate himself in this way. And so if this Qur'an is not from the Prophet, and the Prophet is the one who is initially reciting all these ayat, then who can it be from? One would have to seriously entertain the idea that it has to be from the God which he is calling to. So we say these ayat, which are rebuking the Prophet, are one of the strongest evidences that this Qur'an is not from the Prophet, hence it is from Allah. So it actually makes for a great evidence for the Muslim. So just ponder over this. So these types of Muslims who get a little too passionate about this issue just need to ponder over this idea and it will become plain to them the wisdom behind the Prophet making mistakes and being rebuked by Allah in the Qur'an. 
Hadith 93 from Abu Dhar. He asked the Prophet, did you see your Lord? And he replied, Nurun anna arah. It was light. How could I see him? Meaning to say the hijab of Allah Jalla wa'ala is light. So this is clear evidence that the Prophet did not see Allah on the night of ascension with his eyes. Hadith 94. How Allah Jalla wa'ala does not sleep from Abu Musa. He says that the Prophet stood up in front of us and he said, إن الله عز وجل لا ينام ولا ينبغي له أن ينام. Allah does not sleep and it is not befitting for him to be sleeping. يخفض القسط ويرفعه. He lowers and raises the القسط. So either this means the scales, meaning justice. So he will raise or lower the scales of your good deeds and bad deeds. Or it could also mean الرزق, the provision, as some scholars have explained it. And he goes on. يرفع إليه عمل الليل قبل عمل النهار. وَعَمَلُ النَّهَارِ قَبْلَ عَمَلِ اللَّيْلِ The actions of the night are raised to him before the actions of the day, and the actions of the day are raised to him before the actions of the night. حِجَابُهُ نُورُ وَفِي رَوَايَةٍ النَّارِ لَوْ كَشَفَهُ لَأَحْرَقَتْ سُبُحَاتُ وَجْهِهِ مَنْتَهَ إِلَيْهِ بَصَرُهُ مِنْ خَلْقِهِ his hijab is light, and in another wording, fire. And if he was to remove it, the brightness of his face would burn everything of his creation which his vision reaches. Meaning it would burn everything. As for his hijab, it would be light because in the previous narration, the Prophet said, it was light, how could I see him? So it means the hijab of Allah is light and not fire. We find here the Prophet says that Allah does not sleep and it is not befitting for him to sleep. Actually, for Allah to sleep is an impossibility and a logical absurdity. Because Allah by his very nature does not sleep. So he cannot be sleeping and not be sleeping at the same time. And when we say Allah does not sleep, it is not good enough just for us to stop it there. Rather we have to say Allah does not sleep because his living is perfect. Now and only now does this become a praise. Otherwise we could say something like, the brick wall does not commit injustice. Yes, it's true, it does not commit injustice. That's because it does not have the ability to commit injustice. And if Allah was to sleep, then who would be controlling and managing the affairs of the heavens and the earth? So if Allah sleeps or does not exist, then this actually means that the whole heaven and the earth does not exist either. And seeing as though we do exist, so Allah Jalla Allah exists as well. Not only that, but He does not sleep. In a similar way, the people of Jannah will not go to sleep. Because sleeping would therefore mean that you would be missing out on the delights of Jannah. So the living of the people of Jannah will be more complete than the living of the people in this life. We learn that the actions of the slaves are raised to him. One might ask, but does Allah not already know the actions of his slaves? So what is this idea about the actions being raised to Allah? The idea behind this is a display of the complete authority of Allah Jalla wa'ala. He has malaika working for him. Of course Allah does not need anyone to work for him, but the fact that he has malaika working for him is a display of his kingship and his authority. Every king has servants working for him, and Allah is the king of kings, the supreme king. So we say this is a display of his authority and majesty, and that Allah does not need anything to happen. Let's take some questions. Question number one. What was the Prophet's first revelation from Allah Jalla wa'ala? Question number two. What two times was the Prophet's chest physically opened and cleansed. Question number three. When we talk about Al-Masih, then what does that word mean when it is referred both to Ad-Dajjal and to Isa alayhi salam?